Are we going to be resuming with the testimony of Dr. Kajowski? Yes. Okay, let's verify that he's here and then the is not present. Please be seated. <coughs> Jury is present again in the courtroom. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did everyone follow my instructions over the overnight recess? Yes. yes. Is anyone aware of any violations of any? No. All right. How would the state like to proceed? All right. Let's call in Dr. Pajowski, please. And just for the record, sir, if you would please state your full name. Uh, my name is Krzysztof, K-R-Z-Y-S-C-T-O-F, last name Podjaski, P-O-D-J-A-S-K-I. Thank you. You may continue your direct examination. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Approach the witness, judge. You may. Show you states F-V. FW, FY, and FZ. Do you recognize yes. those exhibits? And how do you recognize them? Uh, they have a, a very specific number. And is this, are these photographs depicting the injuries you observed on the autopsy performed on Gary Henry? Yes. At this time, I'll offer them your evidence. Any objection? Okay, without objection, I believe we are at 168, 169. GB, GC, GD, GE, GF. Do you recognize those? Yes. And how do you recognize them? They have the very specific number, 12-484. And these are photographs that you that were taken during the autopsy of Mr. Hembry. Yes. And I'd offer them into evidence. Objection. Without objection, then those will be 172 through 177. And <coughs> <evidence>. <coughs> hey, doctor, I want to talk to you now about what you characterized as the ninth bullet hole or injury on Mr. Hembry. Okay, doctor, I'm going to show you what's okay, marked. Well, can you have the attorney's approach, please? <clears throat> okay, do Dr. Wojcicki, I'm going to ask that you, you place your, your report to the side, and if you need to use it to refresh your memory, just let me know, and we can go back to it. Yes. Okay. So if you can just set it off to the side. Excuse me? Can you set it off to the side, please? What, this? Yep. On the side? Yep, just set it off. If you need to review it, just let me know so we know that right, that's what you're doing. Can we just turn it over? And if you need to refresh your recollection, just let us know that, sir. Obviously, I will, because it's... There are I understand, motivations. but there's a procedure, okay? Yes, yes, yes absolutely. You, All right. Stage 168. Can you see what we're looking at in Stage 168? Yes. And what are we looking at there? Entrance wound. Okay. And it's it's designated by a uh, marker nine. Can I refresh my memory? Can you see it on the, the well, photograph? Yes. Okay. And were you able to track the that entry, that bullet wound's path? Yes. Okay. And do you recall as you sit here the exact path of that bullet? Yes. And where did it go? The skin, subcutaneous tissues, and muscles of the left arm. Okay. Did it exit? Yes. And where did it exit? Uh, can I refresh my memory? Um, you can. Okay. Is your memory refreshed? Yes. And where did um, 
what's designated in states 168, that entrance that's marked with number nine, where did that exit at? Left lateral upper arm. And I'm going to show you stage 169. Or posterior. This is left uh, anterior left arm. And is that? Left, left anterior arm, yes. Okay. Is that the exit of the previous photo that we saw? Yes. Stage 170. We're looking at number 10 on that photograph? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize that? Can I refresh my memory? You can. Well, if it will refresh your memory to testify to this exhibit. Because I, I really don't remember. Why we're looking at number 10? It's, it's out of order. We on? And I, do you, do you I, recognize this photograph, though? That's what I'm asking you. Yes. Okay. And what are we looking at in number marker 10 on that photograph? I would have to look at my notes okay. again. If, if that will refresh your memory. Yes. Is your memory refreshed, sir? Yes. And what is number 10? This is the entrance wound. And were you able to track the entrance wound of that particular bullet hole? Yes. And where did it go? Uh, it went from, can I look again? Let me show you All something. gunshot wounds are so close, it's impossible for me to memorize every single gunshot wound. That, that's okay. Maybe this will refresh your memory. It states 171. Number 14. Number 14 is exit. Okay. And that, that particular path of that bullet was through the tissue and muscle? Yes. States 172. Can I refresh my memory again? If it will help assist in testing. Because I don't remember. Okay, well, hold on. There's not a question. Do you, do you recognize what is being depicted in by marker 11 on this photograph? Gunshot wound. Okay. And can you tell if that's an entrance or an exit? No, I can't because I have to refresh my memory. You may. It looks like entrance wound. <clears throat> it looks like it. Did you note that in your um, report as an entrance? Is it an entrance? I mean, it's got. Well, I would have to look at my notes again. If you could do that, it will help you testify. Thank you. Yes. Is this entrance? And were you able to track that that bullet hole? Yes. And states one seventy three. And at number 16, you recognize that? Can I look at my notes? You can. Yes, number 16 is entrance of gunshot wound number 10. Is it entrance? I'm sorry, exit. And th again, this the photos that were the entrance and exit that were depicted in 172 and 173. The, the path of that projectile was through muscle and tissue? Yes. States 174. Do you recognize states 174? It's gunshot wound. Can I refresh my memory? If that will assist in your testimony and it will refresh your memory, yes. Yes. This is entrance wound right here. And were you able to track the direction of that injury? Yes. And where did it go? Uh, skin, subcutaneous tissues, and muscles of and, the left arm. And did it exit? Yes. Okay. States 175. Marker number 15. This is you exit wound. Yes. States 176. What are we looking at? 
United States 176. Can I refresh my memory? If that will assist. Yes, this is execute. I'm sorry, it's a... I'm thing. sorry. <laughs> my birthday today. And transferred. Okay. And were you able to track that projectile through the body? Yes, and skin, subcutaneous tissues, and muscles of arm. And where did it exit? Can I refresh my if memory? That will refresh your memory. Right upper chest. States 177. Yes, it's the exit. States 178. Do you recognize what's depicted in 178? Can can I refresh my memory? Please. Yes. Okay. And what are we looking at there? We're looking entrance wound number 28, number 29. It's exit. And we can also see in this particular exhibit number 27. Do you recognize number 27 up there in the photograph? Can I look at my notes? If that will refresh your memory. Number 27 is exit wound. Okay. And where did that exit wound come from? From gunshot wound number 26. Okay. And do you know where 20, where the entrance is for that particular projectile? Where on the body? Can I refresh my memory? That will refresh your memory. Number 26 was in right anterior lateral thigh. So, up here? Yes. States 179. States 179? Yes. And what is that? It's the t-shirt that was removed from the ceiling's body. Okay. From Mr. Hembury? Yes. Okay. States 180. What are we looking at in States 180? It's a fragment of projectile recovered from a t-shirt. Okay. And 181. It's the same fragment, I believe. A closer up picture. Close up picture. Dr. Pajowski, I want to take you back to the what we call the first one. In this particular injury, and it's on states 151, this particular bullet entry. You had testified yesterday that it was an indeterminate range. Yes. Can you please explain to the jury uh, a little bit more? You talked a little bit about the soot and the stippling, but some factors that would affect whether or not soot or stippling could be present. Um, things getting in the way, distance, what else? Well, um, the soot of stippling can be stopped, for example, by air, by clothing. I found a lot of injuries. Uh, multiple partial thickness lacerations and abrasions over the forehead, nose, right zygomatic region, and also right shoulder and right upper extremities. That could be associated with his fall. Uh, if I don't see clearly stippling, I wouldn't call it stippling. So, uh, soot and those particles could be stopped by clothing and hair. Okay. But my opinion, and I'm entitled to it, all 
shells were fired from undetermined range. Simply means I cannot tell you okay. how close was the barrel from the victim. And then going back to states 149. That is, an, that is an entry wound, correct? Definitely, yes. And you shave that area around that? We always shave. So the, the fact that, around the gunshot wounds. So the fact that there's hair around that would make it hard to tell if there were stippling present? That's correct. In your training and experience in the literature that you reviewed, is there a, a distance on when stippling's expected to be seen, if all things are perfect? Can you repeat your question, please? It, I think you had said yesterday 36 inches or something of that effect for, for stippling to be present. Did you say that or no? Yes. Okay. And it, that's based on training and experience? Yes. And literature? Yes. Okay. Um, you had discussed already clothing potentially getting in the way or preventing the stippling, which would be injuries to the body, right? Yes. Um, and then if so, if someone were hypothetically to be standing over someone pointing a gun down at them, would you expect to see stippling or, or not? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. In the case of the autopsy of Mr. Hembry, do you have an opinion as to the cause and manner of death? Yes. And what is that? Multiple gunshot wounds and the manner of homicide. In the case of the autopsy involving Mr. Hembry, could you tell the members of the jury his height and weight? No. You didn't measure him or? Can I refresh my memory? If you, it refreshes your memory, yes. In my report, it says that the body measures 73 inches and weights 196 pounds. Okay. And for Mr. Uh, Picor, Roger Picor, do you have his height and weight? Can I refresh my memory? If that will assist, yes. Seventy six inches and two hundred eighty four pounds. Did you in the autopsy of Mr. Hembry, did you also take um, bodily fluids like you did in Mr. Picor's case? Yes. And did you send them to an outside lab? Yes. And were you able to get the results of those? Can I refresh my memory? If that will assist. We found the presence of alcohol point one zero five and evidence that he smoked marijuana. And as it relates to the autopsy involving Mr. Picor, you had an opinion as to his cause and manner of death? Yes. And what was that? Gunshot wounds of head and the man was called homicide. Cross-examination. Hey, Doctor, good morning. Good morning. I want to talk, start with talking about manner of death. Uh, as a medical examiner, you only have five distinct categories to choose from for manner of death. Is that correct? Yes. That being natural, accidental, suicide, homicide, and undetermined. That's correct. And when you say homicide as a medical examiner, you're referring specifically to the killing of a human being through human agency. Is that right? That's correct. For instance, it, you've certainly done uh, autopsies of individuals that were involved in police shootings. People yes. that were shot and killed by police officers. Yes. You would declare that a homicide, regardless of whether or not it was a justified shooting by law enforcement. That's correct. Okay. I want to talk with you briefly about the soot and stippling that you described. You described the three different ranges, the close, intermediate, and indeterminate. Yes. Close is somewhere within 12 inches. Well, it could be even contact, which is when barrel touches the body. Right. Close, uh, yes. 
zero to 12 inches. Yes. And at that point, you'd see possibly burn marks from the gun at close. Yes. You would see soot and stippling, possibly, within that 12-inch range. Possibly. Intermediate is somewhere between 12 inches to the three feet you testified yesterday. Yes. And that's where you'd see just the stippling. Is that right? Stippling, yes. Uh, some of the literature even says 50 centimeters to 150 centimeters uh, for that intermediate range. Is that right? That's close. Stretching it as far then as 4 feet 11 inches at the, the high end. Uh, well, the best way to solve the problem is to have exact same gun, exact same ammunition, and follow multiple and fire multiple shots let's say to to white sheet so it's closed and fire 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 every time you measure distance and then you will see the point when you will stop seeing suit most likely let's say about 12 inches and then the further you are than firing shots the stippling like i mentioned yesterday it's going to look like a funnel it's going to be bigger 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 and it will disappear so now you measure that distance when you don't see stippling to the sheet and you know exactly that beyond that point I would call it under time and you're, it depends on different power powders that, right you're you know, describing the the vapor sledge that comes out of very complicated issue the you're describing the vapor sledge that comes out yeah. of the firearm um, you didn't do any of that testing with the Beretta in this particular no. case Now, I think you mentioned this just a moment ago, that Roger Pecor was 76 inches. Is that correct at the time of your autopsy? Yes. So that would be 6 foot 4 inches tall. Yes. And then Gary Hembry was 73 inches, so 6 foot 1 inch yes. tall? Yes. Uh, both had alcohol and possible marijuana use in their system. Yes. Right? Uh, as it relates to Mr. Picor, there you noted two gunshot wounds. Is that right? Yes. Both in the area of the head. Yes. As it relates to Gary Hembry, you noted 15 total gunshot wounds. Yes. In various parts of Mr. Hembry's body. Yes. Uh, so as it relates to Mr. Picor, there were no gunshot wounds to Mr. Picor's chest. Is that right? Mr. Mr. Pecor, the, Correct. the first one. Moment to confer, Your Honor. You may. Nothing further, Your Honor. Any redirect? Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. You may step down. State's next witness. Good morning, ma'am. If you'd please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear it were from tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Please have a seat over here on the witness stand. Please state your full name. Detective Sarah Max Cassie. You can spell your first and last names. Sarah, S-A-R-A, -A, and Max Cassie is M-A-C-S-K-A-S-S-Y. -S -S Thank you. You may inquire. And Detective Max Cassie, still employed with the Titusville Police Department? Yes, sir. And were you employed with them in 2012? Yes, sir. Did you have an occasion during the investigation of Mr. Woodward and the deaths of Gary Hembry and Roger Bacor and the shooting of uh, Bruce Timothy Blake to have contact with Mr. Woodward. I did. And where did that occur? At the Titusville Police Department. And what was the purpose of your contact? Uh, to interview him after the incident had occurred. 
Okay. And approximately what time did that occur after the, or how many hours after the incident did that occur? It was several hours after. Okay. Same day? Same day, yes. Same day being September 3rd, 3rd 2012? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you made contact with him, did you take him somewhere to, to interview him? Yes, I took him to one of the formal interview rooms that we have that's audio and video recorded. Okay. And did you audio and video record your interaction with Mr. Woodward? I did. And did you speak with him? I did. Okay. You may? Yes, sir. And how do you recognize that? I recognize it by my initials and my ID number here on and, the side. And it's a CD or a DVD. What is that? Uh, this is a DVD of the interview that I conducted with Mr. Woodward. And is it the complete interview with Mr. Woodward? Yes. Okay. And is it a fair and accurate representation of the conversation you had with him on September 3rd of 2012? Yes, sir. And do you see Mr. Woodward in the courtroom? I do. Could you please identify him by something he's wearing? Uh, he's wearing a gray suit with a blue shirt and blue tie. Okay. And which end of the table that you're directing at? It would be my left. Okay. At this time, I'll offer it to evidence. <coughs> you may. Ma'am, specifically, what time of the early morning hours of September 3rd did you interview Mr. Woodward? I would have to look at my report to get the exact time. I believe it's in my narrative. Do you have your report with you? I do. If you could refer to that, because I'm interested in the exact time. I don't note it specifically in my report. It should be visible on the video itself because the date and time were accurate on the recording system. Okay. You would agree that Mr. Woodward had been continuously in custody, hadn't slept uh, through that period of time? That would be correct. Okay. Uh, no objection to GK? All right. Without objection, that will be number 180. May we approach? Yes. But no objection, 182 in evidence? All right, so that's been introduced as 182 in evidence. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the evidence you are about to receive concerning other crimes, wrongs, or acts allegedly committed by the defendant will be considered by you for the limited purpose of proving motive, intent, or ill will, and you shall consider it only as it relates to those issues. However, the defendant is not on trial for a crime, wrong, or act that is not included in the indictment. So with that, the state may publish number 182. I'm trying to I'm not sure that. We actually have all of them, yeah. And when we finish this, I got a problem at the museum. Yeah, I don't mind at all.
have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have a lawyer present with you while you're being questioned. Mm -hmm. If you cannot afford to hire an attorney, one will be appointed to represent you before any questioning, if that's what you would like. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Do you understand these rights as I'll explain them to you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think I have a VA attorney that's helping me right now. His name is Brian Kurz. Brian Kurz? Yes, ma'am. And he's a, an attorney in Orlando, and I had contacted him when I got my battery charge. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, Jordy, check that out. Part of it. Yeah. Uh, you don't have a record, so. I, no, I've always been an outstanding right? citizen. I've always tried to carry myself as, mm -hmm. as a good person. I mean, I, I just snapped tonight. I understand. But having these rights in mind, is it okay if we continue talking? Because um, like I said, I guess I, I have nothing to hide. <laughs> okay. What I need you to do, put your initials next to each one of these boxes, and then your signature right there. Okay. Right. Not a little steady for you so it doesn't slide around. Thank you, ma'am. No problem. Um, what's going to happen with my wedding rings that uh, Anderson took from me? Nothing. You can keep those? Well, I'd like my wife to have them if they're going to be taken from me. I don't see why they should be taken from you. Okay. And my belt and my shoes, because I like that one. There's a belt in your shoes, so we will have to go on your property. But well, your wedding rings you can have. And my feet are going to end up freezing tonight. Yeah, now you'll get those back. That's no problem. Let's go through this real quick. I'll sign this with the person that read it to you. Okay. That's a nice titanium ring you got there. What is your full name? William Theodore Woodward, W-O-O-D-W-A-R-D. Okay. What's your birthday? 10-26-1968. Your highest level of education? Oh, shoot. <laughs> well, about a year and a half of college, I had actually completed one year of machining. I got a certificate out of that. So you could say I'm... Uh, uh, You've got college. Yeah, I got college. Your home address? 1960 Smith Drive South Titusville 3270 Your social? 589 32 2457 2457 And where were you born? Mount Kisco with a K, New York, raised here in Brevard County. Okay. All right. So let's, let's start with today. You said that your neighbors had started a war with you. Can you explain that to me? Oh, man, it goes all the way back to August 5th. August 5th. What started August 5th? Well, August 5th I learned that uh, my daughter's birthday present had been stolen off our front porch by Gary Henry's daughter. Okay. And her two little cohorts, which are Kim Silsbury Cast's daughters. Uh, Gary and Kim are girlfriend, or boyfriend and girlfriend. Okay. Kim has two daughters and Gary has a young daughter named Destiny. Destiny's a little hell yeah. <laughs> uh, she's very destructive around the neighborhood. She tries to break in the abandoned houses. Okay. Uh, my daughter has caught her repeatedly trying to steal out of her bedroom okay. uh, when she would come over and play at our house. Mm -hmm. At one time, Gary and I did have a working friendship for many years. What changed that? Uh, him smoking pot in front of the kids. Oh, understandable. Okay. Uh, one of his ex-girlfriends, uh, when they broke up, there was a big fight. And his girlfriend came over to the house and filled us in on some information about Gary that we did not know that they 
for instance, uh, smoking pot for the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, little lascivious behavior. Okay. So what we did was we forbid my daughter to go on his property in his house. However, she could play in front of his house. Right. So that put a strain on our relationship. Did you, did you confront him as to why the kids weren't allowed to play over there? Or is, that, is that what caused the strain, or was it a self-imposed strain? It was a self-imposed strain, and my daughter, we talked to my daughter privately about why she couldn't go over there. Okay. We told her about the marijuana, and my daughter was old enough at the time to understand. Okay. Uh, we didn't want to cause a rift. try to maintain a friendship with Gary. In the meantime, he was bopping the neighbor's wife, <laughs> and that started a whole other fight, and mm-hmm. we got drunk in the middle of it. Okay, let me, let me get back to it. <laughs> let me get back to the war zone. <laughs> so, uh, August 5th, when I found out that the property had been stolen off my front porch, escort because being a combat stress brain damage veteran I'm less likely to blow if I have someone as a mediator right. to help keep my temper in check makes sense are you diagnosed with anything else post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder. Okay. Um, I've got severe internal brain damage, and I'm currently taking four different medicines to regulate my serotonin and brain function. Okay. And I'm going to need those tomorrow. Okay. I am. I really am. Okay. So when we went to confront Gary that morning on... Remember about tonight? Well, I 
remember laying down with my son. And okay. Watching SpongeBob. And he fell asleep. And then when I got up, uh, my wife and my daughter were getting ready for bed. And my brain was just racing, racing and racing and racing and racing. Is that normal for you at night? No. Okay. We've been under so much stress the last month because we've been cooped up in our cave because these people just this. just won't quit tormenting us. They torment us <coughs> day and night. Mm-hmm. They stalk us, they harass us, they threaten us. And the police, because breach of peace and stalking has, has, has such a wide interpretation of the law, the police won't make an arrest because it can be interpreted in so many different ways. Okay. So we've just been frustrated with the cops. I know they mean well and... But you don't feel like they're taking care of the situation? No. Okay. And, and it's, not necessarily, it's not necessarily the police, it's the way the laws are written. Right, I understand. But because there's that big gray area, mm-hmm. the cops don't want to mess with it. Right. They, they only want to tackle the things they know they can win. Okay. So as soon as the cops leave, they go right back to taunting and harassing. And they insult the parents. They threaten Roger, the one guy I killed tonight, uh, threatened to beat my father up with a baseball bat twice. Uh, they constantly insult my parents when my parents come over to help guard us against them. They insult anybody that we bring over, our neighbors, Mm -hmm. Uh, getting back to August the 5th, when he started taking pictures and I went off the deep end, I called him out in the room. (laughs) I stormed out of the house. I disarmed myself with my 2K bar knives, and I went out in the road. I lifted up my shirt, and I said, Gary, I'm unarmed. Get out in the road. I want to whoop your ass. I said, you want to mess with my chicken? So that's, that's, you're messing with the wrong. No, sir. Don't fuck with me. I'm going to whoop your ass. Get out in the street. And he wouldn't. He said, no, you come on my property. I said, no, come out here on public property where I can whoop your ass. <laughs> and uh, it turned into just a big old shot match. Okay. And uh, Carrie Blake, who lives next door, is just a loud mouth bitch who likes to get her nose in everybody else's business. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't her business, but she decided she wanted to make her a business. She says, you want some of me? I says, tell you what, bring your ass out of the road and I'll whoop your ass too. I was afraid at one point she was becoming suicidal, but I was afraid to ask her. 
Because of all the stress involving the other two families? Yeah, they just, they were constantly harassing us, day in and day night. The day in and, and, and night. That's right. And they were targeting me specifically because they know I'm a disabled veteran. They know that if I blow, go over the deep end and do something to go to jail or prison, that I lose all benefits and all, everything that I've worked hard mm -hmm. and earned. And then I can't support my family. And I succeeded in doing that tonight. Well, let me ask you this. Do you remember leaving your house tonight? Vaguely. Were you walking, or did you do something else? No, uh, for some reason I had a lucid conversation with Officer Anderson. Okay. And I was in the war zone, and I told him my will call. From your house? From my house. Which direction did you go when you left your house? I exited the rear garage door. Mm -hmm. I went out my back gate. When I got to my garbage can, which is to the northeast corner of my garage, okay. I immediately went into what the military calls a crouching stance. Okay. And I used my truck for cover, so they couldn't see my movement. Where's the truck? My white pickup truck in New York. Okay. Okay. So did you end up crossing the street? Like, did you cross Smith or did you cross Lane? I crossed Smith, but it took me a long time to get there. That's where the low crawler came in. Okay. I hadn't moved my grass in a while because I can't go outside. Mm -hmm. I, I can't go outside and do anything. I'm not worried about being worried about them and what they'll do. Well, I'm afraid if I turn my back, they're going to follow through with a threat and, okay. and jump me with baseball bats. And right. So and how far? I'm mean, with that constant fear. Okay. How far did so you crawl? I crossed my rock garden. Mm -hmm. I crossed my sidewalk on my hands and knees. As soon as I got to the grass. I instantly got as low as a snake. Okay. And I remember crawling inches at a time and was listening to him taunting and yelling across the street. Your mom's a fucking bitch. You dickhead. We're gonna fuck you up. We're gonna it's all on surveillance. You yeah. can, you can actually you can actually hear and see for yourself what they did tonight. So did they see you coming across the road? Or were they just yelling, no, yelling, no, yelling to yell? When I was outside, they didn't know I, they didn't know where I was. I was wearing my camouflage jacket and I had my camouflage pants on. Like I said, I, I'm a soldier. I fight to win. Okay. This is war to me. This is not murder. Okay. This is killing the enemy. Understood. I'm not disagreeing with you on this. Okay. Um, I'm just telling you the mm -hmm. facts is... I'm just trying to get them as you remember them and the chain of events that you remember. Um, I low crawled past my truck. Mm -hmm. I was on my belly. Um, my FS brother was on my right hip. Okay. My extra clip was in my left pocket. Okay. Um, my BDU jacket covered my left pocket so the dirt wouldn't fill it up as I was moving across the ground. So I drug my left leg. And if you've never been in the military, you wouldn't understand how to crawl, but you basically slide your head and face across the ground. Mm -hmm. And you maintain as low as low profile as humanly possible. They teach us that too. Yeah. But you guys do, do, do it quite a bit different. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they teach you in the Army how to hunt down and kill your enemy, it's quite a different scenario. Mm hmm. They teach you that they fire from hostile enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, At what point did you stand up? I did. Okay. I kept low crawling. Okay. And at one point they turned on the surveillance lights or the security lights on the house. And they were at the street corner. Yeah. 
yelling and screaming obscenities in our house. And this is all recorded on my surveillance at home. Right. And it just drove me into a rage. I was, I was already over the edge and I just couldn't control myself. So what did you do next? I kept on crawling. Okay. I was on a military mission. I was going to end this war. Whose who's yard did you cross into first? I kept on crawling. I would crawled around the perimeter of my house mm -hmm. to my backyard fence. The grass was high enough where it covered my... It concealed my movement. Mm -hmm. I would crawl along my fence between my area and my hibiscus. And I stayed there while the security light was on, and I just listened to him yelling and screaming at me. They didn't know where I, that I was inside or outside. Or they, they, they assumed I was inside, but they were yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs. <laughs> Insults and threats. And calling my mom a bitch and a whore. And telling them they were going to whoop my dad's ass. And that just further enraged me unless I lay there. With a loaded pistol on my hip. Mm -hmm. And all I could think about was anymore. How long did you sit there and listen to them when they were shouting? For minutes. I waited for the lights to go out. Okay. When you hunt down an enemy, patience is a virtue. Mm -hmm. If you have no patience, you're not going to make a good soldier. So I waited for the lights to go out. And eventually they all got bored and they went back up towards the garage. So I continued my low crawl around the perimeter of the fence until I made it to my neighbor's fence, my backyard neighbor's fence. Okay. At which point I got up on my hands and knees and I crouched to the light pole and the juniper tree that set our property line. And from there, I stood in the shadow and I evaluated traffic and saw that really that everything was calm. So I bolted across lane to mm -hmm. Gary's property line. I was vertical, not vertical, but crouched. Mm -hmm. I walked to, I walked along his fence. When I got to the corner of his fence, I jutted into his property. When I got to his property, I snuck along the perimeter of his house until I got to the corner of his house. When I got to the... When I got to the corner of the house is when I charged. Where was he at when he first entered the property? Who? I'm assuming Gary's house. He said it was Gary's, Gary's house is on the corner. Hmm? Gary's house is 1950 Smith Drive on the corner. Okay. And he said that was the one that you went around? That's the one I went around. Okay. At what point did you see someone standing? I didn't. Okay. I knew, or I know as a soldier, that when you engage your enemy, you have to have the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. You have to have ferocity and speed and accuracy when you rush your enemy. And when I rushed up, Roger's son was on top of him. They were wrestling. Roger's son jumped off his back when he saw me. And I shot Roger in the torso. Okay. Uh, you all have to listen to the video to count the amount of time. Right now I couldn't tell you. Okay. He slumped to the ground. I heard Bruce Blake say something. I followed him to his garage. He tried to go inside the door. I put rounds into his torso until he slumped to the ground. Okay. I 
turned back and found Roger writhing in pain. I point blank put two rounds in his head. Okay. I believe two rounds, maybe one. I don't remember. Okay. And at that, no, no, no. Let me back up. After shooting Bruce Blake, Gary come out. Gary Hembry come out of his garage and said, "What the hell's going on out here?" Hmm. And I had a clean shot at his chest, and I put one dead center of his chest. He slumped to the ground. I walked past Roger, who was writhing in pain, and I shot Gary Hembry twice in the head. Okay. If I remember correctly, you'll have to count the bullet holes when you guys go do the autopsy. I'm pretty sure that's correct. And then I walked back over and saw Roger, and in order to make sure there were no survivors on the battlefield, I point blank shot him in the head once or twice. I did not go back and finish the job for Bruce Blake because I was out of bullets. Okay, see you right now. I used 31 rounds. Okay. Two 15 round clips and one in the chamber. Okay. So 31 total. 31 total. Right. And you ran dry? Ran dry. Okay. On three people. Okay. What, what did you do after that? engage any children. I did not engage any women. You do not engage okay. children and women on the battlefield. They are not the enemy. I walked across the street to my house. I was in the process of taking off my jacket because the mission was accomplished. Okay. I went to the back gate where I had dropped off my house keys. all of the reports yet. I plan on pulling them all because I want to know about that. I want to see the statements that were made because I know there were some threats made. As a father, you have no idea what that does to a man's mind. That's correct. I don't. I can imagine. I can't even, I can't even tell you the day she made those threats. I was so enraged. If I could have got my hands on her, I was going to dismember her and disembowel her. I even told her I'm going to disembowel and eat your guts. I was, I could not believe what come out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. And this is a woman, we paid her rent, we paid her water bill, we put clothes on her kid's back, we put food in her mouth, we had been nothing but good neighbors to them, and when this fight started with me and Gary, she stuck her nose in it because she wanted to be top bitch. Mm -hmm. Why would someone 
who bent over backwards to help your family, why would you go and fuck them in the ass like that? A good question. She had no business in my affair with Gary, but yet she made it her business, and she was the main instigator along with Roger Pacour. First, How do you feel with, besides them? Because, I mean, I understand that three men, it seems like, took it upon themselves to gang up on you. Yeah, every one of them. Roger, Gary, Bruce, Carrie Blake, mm -hmm. Kim, Jessica Nobles, mm -hmm. all of them. So that whole group? The whole fucking group. Who do you think is the ringleader? Carrie Blake and Roger Pacour and Gary. Just to tag along. He just likes to get drunk and then throw his two cents in. <laughs> he thinks he's tough. Ma'am, I apologize for my language, but now I'm getting upset. You don't have to apologize to me. You're speaking from the heart. I know, I'm getting I upset. That. I'm getting upset again. Just because we're remembering it? I'm having flashbacks. Okay. Well, do me a favor. Take a deep breath. Try to focus on the sound of my voice. It's very okay. sweet. Well, thank you. I did try. Try to stay in the here and now with me as best you can, okay? I have no regrets. No, I understand that. I understand that. I was protecting my family. Mm-hmm. I understand that, too. And I've honorably served my country. I was honorably discharged. Mm -hmm. I went to war with brain damage. Yeah. I didn't skip the war. I didn't skip out on the war. Mm -hmm. I went. You went for quite some time. You were there for quite a while. Compared to most folks. And I come back and I'm treated like this by civilians who never even wore the uniform. Well, they have no understanding for what it's like either. They have no concept of sacrifice. All they do is take and take and take and they spit on people like me. Yeah. And I can't take it no more. But do you sincerely feel like everything's finished now? I'll tell you what. If the two women, Kim, mm -hmm. if, excuse me, if the three women, Kim, Jessica, and Carrie Blake, continue the fight, then I have a feeling my dad wanted to fall. That your dad will end up for you? I promise you. Okay. My family will be protected even though I'm behind bars. Mm -hmm. My dad's a former street cop from the 70s. Mm -hmm. He's hurt a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And he's hurt a lot of people badly. Well, let me ask you this, though. I promise you my family will be protected. And do you feel like you should go to jail for them? No. Because I have pleaded, I have begged, and I have asked for help. And I even went before Judge Moxley, who practically just spit in my fucking face, mm -hmm. who wouldn't listen to a shred of evidence, who allowed them to perjure themselves in court, who lied like a pack of fucking wolves, who said I had a weapon on me, a gun. Listen to my voice. Take a breath. Take a breath. I'm right here and I'm listening. It's okay. Dean Moxley mm -hmm. thumped me in the ass. Tom House allowed them sorry fucks to press charges against me for possessing a firearm in which I did not have, but he did so because my brother's a fire chief and he didn't want to show favoritism. So fucking Sergeant House cut my fucking balls off and Judge Moxley had the nerve to sit and listen to each and every one of their fucking lies and say, yes, I believe you had a gun, Mr. Woodward. And when I tried to say perjury, Mm -hmm. When they were perjuring themselves, he said, Mr. Woodward, if you don't shut your mouth, I will make these subpoenas, the uh, injunctions stick. And he wouldn't even give the police officers a chance to speak. We threw $320 fucking dollars at the window, subpoenaed four officers, had Major Butler there.
they're prepared to speak on our behalf as to their behavior, and he did not even entertain the evidence that we brought. He didn't let us speak. He let the fucking dirtbags speak. When court was over, the dirtbags hung out in the lobby, and they taunted our witnesses. They taunted my mom. They taunted us. Was that the one? Mm-hmm. 
usually based off of something that's already happened to you, something that's happened before. This has never happened to me before. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Have you ever had delusions or hallucinations? No, I take that back. Something like this, nothing like this has ever happened. But when I got fired out the cake, my mm-hmm. friend to kill the guy that fired me. That was before I was medicated and realized that my brain damage wasn't my problem. Okay. I've had those flashbacks, but that was uh, back in those seven so that was years ago. Okay. I don't know if that flashback has anything to do with it. But okay. I do have flashbacks of the war. I have flashbacks of previous encounters with people that I've fought with. How many times have you had thoughts of wanting to kill the three of them? Or anyone from that group? How many times have you thought about that? She dreamed that she did this or that you did this? No, she did it. Okay. Because she was so upset, so disturbed by what Dean Moxley did to us, by how bad he screwed us. I said, honey, you're not a soldier. You don't fight wars. You're my wife. If wars are going to be fought, I fight them. And I told her that. And I said, so put that out of your mind and don't even think about it. When did that happen? The night after the incident at the courthouse? The, the day after. The day after. The morning after. She had it that night. I mean, she was so shook up over the fight that I had. The pepper spray. Mm-hmm. Uh, me being charged with battery. So let me ask you this. Since she told you that and said that she'd had this, this dream and confided that in you. I'm assuming that you continue to think about that. Well, it bothered me that she had to drink, but I never thought about killing these people. I just wanted... In fact, had you ever thought about killing them before tonight? No, you know why? Okay. 
Because we just find on a brand new house. We're, we're going to a new neighborhood. Well, we were until I fucked up. But I didn't fuck up. I'm for sure. Same with me. So tonight, you had never planned this beforehand, is what you're telling me. I don't know, man. We, my mom and dad and her parents, I mean, we were, we were just so happy that we were finally getting out of the neighborhood. We were going to leave it all behind. Well, how, if you had to estimate how long it was before you left the house to when you finally made the idea to go do this, how long do you think that took for you to formulate that thought and that plan? What do you mean? Well, before you left the house tonight. Oh. To go do what you did. Okay. What you told me that you've done. Uh -huh. How long did you sit there and plan it out and think about it? Did you give it much thought? Says Billy, when you walk your dog, 
go down that way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what they do? I have, to t I have to tell my wife, honey, watch the video camera because if you see them leave the house with their dogs, call me so you can so come, get, come me. get me. You know what that's like every day living? No, I can't imagine, no. I can't yeah, imagine that kind of stress. Sucks. I mean, mm -hmm. here I am. I, I, I'm, I, I live with combat stress every day, mm -hmm. and I'm medicated for it. And, and, and uh, you, do you take your meds regularly? Yeah, I have to because, uh, like I said, I'm bipolar. I got mm -hmm. a serious case of post-traumatic stress disorder. And if I don't take it, my brain damage is severe enough that, well, but it's succinctly, dying is easier than living. Gotcha. And Dr. Reed saved my life. He got me medicated on the even keel. And when I'm not being pushed and harassed and it, it, we even joke every time we see each other, Billy, let's move you out to the country. I said, Dr. Reed, man, when I can afford it, I'm going, man. I want to get out of here. I want to have chickens and pigs and goats. And I get along better with animals than I do people because animals don't want to hurt you. Mm -hmm. only, people, only people want to hurt you. <laughs> they I, I mean, not you, but... No, no, I know what you're saying, though, in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my chickens when. Gary called code enforcement and had my chickens taken away. That just broke my heart because we hand raised every one of them. And they all, they were just, they were my peace and serenity. Yeah. So when we got the news about the house, we were just ecstatic. And all I could think about was leaving all of them behind. Mm-hmm. Starting fresh. Yeah. Leaving them to live in their misery and their dope dealing and let somebody else deal with it. But you know what's sad? Mm -hmm. We lived in that neighborhood for 13 years. Oh, really? Okay. I mean, we still live there. Right, right. And we've made, we've made friendships that have lasted. And we love the people that live there. Mm -hmm. And now we feel sorry for them because they got to stay there. Now, I don't know what the repercussions mm -hmm. and actions are going to be on the, of the house and if we're ever going to be able to get that house now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how far down the road I'm to look now, but... Um, yeah, I can't answer that one for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't expect to. I'm probably heading to the county jail sometime tonight from this morning. Probably. Yeah.
you raise that hand for me? And you swear everything that you told me is the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Well, my dad told me never lie. <laughs> so help me God. So help you God. Okay. That was the conclude the interview. I'm going to have to walk you back and put you back in the cell. Um, and yeah, I don't know how much shoes because my feet are just freezing in here. We'll have to take the laces out. That's fine. I'm not going to have no I have no issue with that. That's uh, fine. The man is cold as shit. <laughs> and I'll get you an extra blanket, too. That's no problem. Like I said, I'm okay. So when do I get transferred? Can I see my parents? Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to make the phone calls as soon as I get you back there because I have to have you secured before I can finish my part of it. Are you, you done with it? You want, you want some more questions? <laughs> I can't think of anything else to ask uh, you. Yeah, I love talking. <laughs> uh, but I do want to tell you, if you fool my record, in, or the 20, whatever you guys call it, 29 or whatever mm-hmm. the hell it is, right. you'll see that I've lived my life mm-hmm. as, as, as best as I can. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any doubt. I've never been a violent man. Mm-hmm. Even when people would push me, I've always turned the other cheek, because that's what God says to do. Turn the other cheek. Tonight, my brain broke. Mm-hmm. Well, like you said, you snapped. I think that's a pretty accurate word. I fought the word that needed to be fought. So. Let's get you back. Thank you for being kind to me. There is not to. I appreciate it. A lot of the cops I run into though have been real cold and callous and didn't really give a crap if I was a disabled veteran or not. Well, a lot of them don't know how to react to that because they've never been around vets. They've never been around disabled vets. You know? They don't, like you said, they don't know how to react to that. You know? I know. And some of those cops have made our situation worse by just turning a blind eye. That's why I'm sitting here today, because they they come out, mm-hmm. turn blind eye, when they could have arrested them for breach of peace, stalking. We've got so much evidence on them, but cops didn't want to do pay for it. Well, I'll be the one sitting going through all of it. So somebody's going to look at all of it, okay? I can't say that. Well, I appreciate it, and I appreciate your help. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate your kindness. I really do. It's not a problem at all. Yeah, you should have got the voice of an angel, man. You know how to take the steam out of my sails. <laughs> there's, there's some training that I got right. You must have a lucky husband. <laughs> Something like that. You know, I should have a lucky wife. <laughs> I just hope she's doing well. Publication of number 182 in evidence. Good morning. It's Texas Max Cassie now? Max Cassie. Max Cassie. Yes, sir. I apologize. And again, I apologize if I slip back because forever embedded in my brain, in this case, you're Detective Kane Watson, according to your, your report. Uh, Detective. First thing that I would like to talk with you about, the time of the interview, as I had asked you uh, just prior to it published, uh, you told us that the time stamp would be accurate. Well, I watched that whole thing. There's no time stamp, correct? There is on the, the file. The, the problem is the way that that's being displayed. It's not in the actual media player that is used to create the program. And usually when that happens, it is displayed in the corner, so. Okay. Well, would it be accurate to say 
that Mr. Woodward had been kept for some period of time both on the scene before he even got there to be interviewed? I believe he was removed from the scene rather quickly. Okay. When do you think he was removed from the scene? That was happening as I arrived, so I don't believe he was on the scene much longer than an hour. Okay. Well, an hour is a pretty long time. It can be. Well, considering everything he'd already been through, that could be a really long time. And then it was at least three hours before this interview was done? That's probably fairly accurate. So now we're doing this interview essentially at four-ish in the morning? Most likely, yes. Okay. After Mr. Woodward had been up all night, was on the medications that he had told you about, had not been able to renew his medications, correct? You all don't give him any medications once you took That's correct. Away. We don't administer medication. Right. Uh, you did have some information because you got it from Detective Brown about the medications that he was on. Did you have that at the time of the interview or did you obtain that later? I obtained that afterwards. Okay. So you hadn't even uh, educated yourself as to the types of medications that Mr. Woodward uh, was under the influence of before you interviewed him that night. Is that correct? No, I would disagree with that. Okay. Then what had you educated yourself as to the types of medication that Mr. Woodward was under the influence of before you interviewed him? I recall that I spoke with Detective Brown briefly before engaging in that interview mm -hmm. just to ascertain the type of medication, but I didn't go through the documented list of them because I knew that there were several. Okay. So I just knew that there was a, a mixture of different types of medications. Including psychotropic medication. That's correct. correct. All right. <clears throat> now, you also had not reviewed any information with Mr. Woodward before he was interviewed about details. Is that correct? No. No, sorry. Obviously. No. Okay. And you yourself had not reviewed uh, evidence such as the surveillance tape, things of that nature. That would be correct. Now, you later learned that even some of the information that Mr. Woodward, that was fixed in his mind, he believed to be true, was inaccurate, specifically in terms of who was shot, where they were shot, uh, how they were shot, and the sequence they were shot. Isn't that correct? Overruled. You can answer. It's not uncommon that during these types of interviews that we do not give out information to the person that we're interviewing because we're trying to elicit responses from them. We want to hear from them in their words what they recall happened. It's not our job to try to interject that into their memory. Right. I mean, uh, suspects are treated differently than police officers when they get in trouble because police officers are allowed to review everything before they even interview, correct? To some degree. That's one of your rights under the Policeman's Bill of Rights, right? It's the same as when you come to trial. They're allowed to review it before they testify. Sure, but not before they're interviewed. That's one of That's the major correct. differences. You get to interview a suspect before they're allowed to see all the evidence. Police officers can't even be interviewed until they're allowed to see all the evidence, correct? That's correct. That's why they're given their rights. Right. Now, in this particular case, certainly we know one of the areas uh, that Mr. Woodward was mistaken on is the fact that uh, he had shot Mr. Uh, Picor in the chest, right? Correct. We know from the autopsy Mr. Picor was never shot in the chest at all, correct? Okay. Isn't that true? I'll take your word for that, sir. I, I have not reviewed the autopsy because of invoking the rule. You have, you were the case agent in this case and you had not reviewed the autopsy? Or is it just that you don't recall? Sitting right here right now, I don't recall because, again, I didn't review the autopsy. Okay. At the time, I had. At the time, The autopsy was completed. On that date and time, the autopsy hadn't even begun. Okay. Well, I understand that. Okay. I'm saying as part of your involvement in this case, one of the things you certainly did is review the autopsy. Correct? That's correct. Okay. And, again, I can refresh your recollection with the autopsy if it would be helpful, but it is a <coughs> fact that Mr. Picior was never shot in the chest at all? I don't immediately recall. Okay. I didn't attend the autopsy. I'll come back to it. I'll, I'll pull that and I'll let you refresh your recollection. Okay. 
likewise, did you ever review, listen to the video as to the shot sequence in this particular case? I did. Okay. The shot sequence in this case was essentially one shot, a couple of seconds, second shot, a couple more seconds. We can hear some metal object hit the ground, and a third shot, and then a pause. Thirteen shots in rapid sequence without a pause, much longer pause, five shots, and then ten shots, correct? I believe that's accurate. Okay. Now, again, that shot sequence is inconsistent even with Mr. <coughs> Woodward's memory of what he's telling you that night. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. Okay. So, again, because, and it's not uncommon for people who are under medication, under stress, things of that nature, even though they believe that they're telling the truth, they're often inaccurate about some details. Isn't that correct? It's extremely common in cases with shootings and other cases like this when you have multiple gunshots that are fired that the person actually shooting those rounds does not immediately recall how many rounds are fired or in which order. Um, that's, that's a well-documented fact. Okay. And eyewitnesses quite often don't have that sort of recollection either. It's the well-documented fact that even their recollection can be quite often at odds of the forensic evidence, which is the most accurate evidence, correct? I would agree with that. Okay. Well, may I approach? You may. You should uh, see if that refreshes your recollection as to whether or not it's a you or not in the chest at any point in time. Yes, sir. Okay. And it is a fact that he was never shot in the chest at any point in time. Correct? That's correct. Now, you also failed to get into any specifics uh, with Mr. Woodward during this interview about what happened to actually make him, as he put it, snap. What the triggering event was in terms of him snapping. Isn't that true? No, sir. Did you ever ask him a question? What happened just before you snapped or anything of that question? I mean, we just heard it. You just heard it. I didn't hear any question like that. Do you recall some, asking him some question along those lines? I thought he was pretty clear on the, uh, the things preceding that and his emotional state. Well, isn't it a fact that in all events there's some sort of triggering event? In this, for example, you've reviewed the tape. Mm -hmm. You heard just before the shooting some conversation about, come on, let's get up, let's go... Let's go get him. That's correct. Okay. You knew that that happened. That, that was, happened just before he acted, correct? Correct. Okay. But you never asked him, is that the triggering event that made you snap, that made you go? Did you? As far as the specific timing of it? Right. No, I did not act, ask that specific question. That okay. correct. So he was so, uh, sharing with you his generalized feelings of what he and his family had been put through that precipitated this event, correct? Correct. As opposed to specifics. That'd be correct. Okay. And you've had the opportunity to hear his testimony at other proceedings, I'm sure, uh, where he does, in fact, go into detail because he is asked that question, correct? I actually have not reviewed any of his testimony in any other case because okay. I knew okay. that this would be happening. All right. Fair enough. Now, one of the things that Mr. Woodward invited you to do uh, during that interview is speak with this VA doctor. Did you do that? We obtained his records from the VA. I did not speak with his doctor specifically. Okay. So you never had any conversation with his doctor specifically at all? I did not. Why is that? Can I have the parties approach, please? Next question. Actually, I think that I will, um, based on the court's previous ruling, I'll just uh, hold this witness for recall in my case and ask the balance of my questions during my case. Okay. Thank you. Any redirect? 
All right. Thank you. You may step down. You are subject to recall. That's okay. the attorney's approach. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to give you an extended lunch today. So if you would leave your notebooks on your chairs, I'm going to ask that you all return at 1.20. So it gives you plenty of time for lunch. And please make sure that you follow all of my instructions during the lunch recess. At this time, you may be excused. Thank you. All right. Please be seated. Still need a few minutes then to uh, review the evidence. Ten minutes? Okay, we'll take a ten minute recess. Thank you. Thank you. To prevent the occurrence of aggravated stalking. Aggravated stalking is somewhat different uh, than the other aspects of the things that we believe the evidence shows Mr. Woodward was acting. Uh, in reasonable self-defense. And one of the changes uh, between force, the forcible felony of aggravated stalking and the other enumerated is the imminency uh, of that, the imminent threat, had already occurred. The forcible felony was in fact occurring from essentially 9 o'clock right through the shooting. So actually, under the law, Mr. Woodward had the right to use force and use deadly force to prevent the occurring forcible felony of aggravated stalking against himself and his family. Now, the evidence actually shows that he waited until there was an imminent threat against his family uh, and to actually act. But notwithstanding that, his right to act under the law was triggered as soon as the forcible felony was complete. And we have evidence of a forcible felony occurring as early as about between 9 and 9.30 in this case. And on several different occasions, we have additional forcible felonies, separate and distinct acts of aggravated stalking. Because the case law is very clear in terms of stalking. If there is a clear break in the behavior, that becomes separate acts of stalking. So we're not talking about just on the second, if you don't even take into account the events that had happened that there's testimony and evidence of, of, you know, from August 5th right up until September 2nd. On September 2nd, we have no less than five separate acts of things that would constitute aggravated stalking, the most egregious of which is the <coughs> fire incident, which is shown on the video. Uh, I have actually I'm going to introduce it as my case, but it's already in evidence. It's just a still shot. But this has been published to the jury. And again, I'll use it as an illustrative aid at this point in time. This act alone is an incredible threat under the forcible felony statute. It is an act of burning that came in the context of previous threats to burn my client's home while he and his family slept. The evidence is, from a couple of different witnesses, that these people that are doing this were under the impression that Mr. Woodward and his family were in his home. And a couple of different witnesses have testified that they were under the impression that he was asleep while this was happening. And they were directing this threat to his family. 
The evidence that is introduced at this point is absolutely clear that that is the action that caused Mr. Woodward to fear for his family, arm himself, and start the process that ended in the shooting of these three people and the death of two of them. The forcible felony had actually begun earlier, arguably, but it is unmistakable at that point in time it was occurring. Now there was another break after that, and there was an additional, according to the evidence, forcible felony and credible threats, where the groups came down and made threats to do harm to Mr. Woodward's family. And then we have the final sequence, the sequence of acts that caused Mr. Woodward to actually react and take the action to defend his family. And while there is some argument that what Mr. Woodward heard was taken out of context or he misconstrued it, the issue is not whether or not that threat was real, but whether a reasonable person would have believed that the threat was real and that he had to act. Not only have we had the playing of those statements in court, and admittedly a version that is difficult to hear, but we've had no less than three witnesses confirm that they heard the critical language, including the last witness that just testified, that she heard from her review of that um, surveillance that was in evidence. And that is the basically the come on, let's go, let's get them. Oh my God, they're going to do it. We're going to end this. And that's what the evidence that the state introduced, which is essentially Mr. Woodward's testimony <clears throat> at the earlier hearing, said was the act that caused him to move, as he's variously described it, to snap. Now, the other cases stand more for the pro uh, proposition that once any evidence of self-defense is introduced, then it is the state's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act in self-defense. And it is our position at this point, not only did the state not prove that my client did not act in self-defense, they overwhelmingly proved that he did act in self-defense. And that he had a reasonable person would have believed not only that the forcible felony of aggravated stalking is present and occurring, but the likely commission of aggravated battery, arson or attempted arson, were imminent threats that my client was acting to intercept. There also is no evidence to the contrary in terms of his assertion that he reasonably believed that the people at the time he shot them possessed firearms. Again, the state introduced that. It doesn't, it's, there's nothing inconsistent with the evidence that they presented that he <coughs> later learned, at, shortly after shooting them, that they were in fact unarmed in his statements to the fact that they were unarmed but they presented absolutely no evidence to the contrary that they were armed or that he did not have a reasonable belief that they were armed at the time that he shot them. As a matter of fact, they presented some evidence which corroborated his testimony in terms of what some of the witnesses had in their hands, etc., where they were reaching, where they were going, where they were moving. The only dispute in terms of that would be the testimony of Justin Pecor, 
uh, regarding his assertion that was disputed by other witnesses uh, that there was no wrestling going on, there was no bat present, there was never a bat present, uh, and that there was only a discussion uh, about fishing. He's out there on an island with that because all of the other uh, witnesses uh, acknowledged that there was, in fact, <coughs> wrestling going on that there was discussion, at least uh, Mr. Blake had agreed, uh, that there was discussion about the bat. We heard discussion in terms of the surveillance that was played in court of discussion about the bat. You can clearly hear a metallic object hitting the concrete between the second and third shot which the evidence overwhelmingly indicates had to be shots directed at Mr. Decor. And the reason for that is, forensically, and based on the pattern of shots, the state's evidence, again, overwhelmingly shows that the three shots that were directed had to be directed at Mr. Decor. The first shot, when my client incorrectly believed that he had shot Mr. Pecor in the chest. Clearly, the evidence, the forensic evidence, suggests that he missed because Mr. Pecor wasn't shot in the chest. And then we have a shot, followed a few seconds later by a second shot, which clearly are the two shots to Mr. Pecor's head. And again, in between that first and third shot, or second and third shot, rather, uh, you can hear this metallic object hit the ground. The next 13 shots, again, have to be directed at Mr. Blake, not Mr. Pecor. Why? Because Mr. Blake was hit 11 times. There's no other sequence of shots that are consistent with his injury other than he was shot during that 13-shot burst without any pause. And 11 of the rounds hit him, and apparently 10 did not, or 2 did not. So that's that 13 shot. That uses up all the bullets in my client's gun. The next, again, the forensic evidence, and the timing of the shots indicates that that would have been when he reloaded. And then you have a series of five shots, followed shortly thereafter by ten shots. All of which the evidence clearly indicates was directed toward Gary Hembry. Because he was shot 15 times. Each one of those shots hit Mr. Hembry. My client is now out of bullets. The suggestion by even himself in some respect, but by the witnesses that he came back and he shot Mr. Pecor, again, his memory was he had shot him in the chest, but again he never shot him in the chest. No projectiles were recovered from the area around where Mr. Pecor was found underneath him in that blood pattern, etc. We know that Mr. Pecor's injuries were through and through injuries. In other words, the bullet did not lodge in his head. So the projectiles went all the way through his face and through his skull. One went through his face, based on the evidence today, without penetrating his brain. And one went through the top of his skull and penetrated uh, near the base of his skull and obviously went through his brain. But there were no other wounds, and there were no projectiles on the ground, so that evidence clearly shows that Mr. Pecor was upright, and the projectiles obviously went through and through and were not recovered. So again, forensic evidence supports a pattern of behavior. We also have blood pattern that shows blood which at this point in time there was no testimony about the testing, but we know that blood was recovered uh, at the driveway 
and then over uh, into the yard, both of those blood samples, based on the evidence that was presented, could only have come from Mr. Picor. No other source possible, because <clears throat> Mr. Blake was never in that area to bleed. Mr. Henry was never in that area to bleed. So those two bloods have to be Mr. Picor. And again, it has to be consistent with the forensic evidence, the shot pattern. So it clearly indicates that Mr. Picor was, as uh, Mr. Woodward testified, standing at or near the driveway, was shot, dropped the bat, you hear the metallic sound, and then fell or stumbled forward or moved forward uh, and was shot a second time and finally uh, laid on the, the ground. Again, the shell cartridge uh, layout of where they were recovered shows a very clear pattern which is consistent with the shot pattern. The shell casings that involved Mr. Picor, the shell casings that involved uh, Mr. Blake. The first five shows that those shots that were directed at Mr. Hembry were at or near uh, the side of the vehicle, similar to where many of the shots that were directed toward Mr. Blake was. We don't know exactly of those, but again, if you just count up where the shell casings are, it shows that that five burst had to be at or around that area because it's the only place where the cartridges could have ended up. And the 10 burst uh, is consistent uh, with the shooting at or near the vehicle because we have uh, nine cartridges that are recovered, uh, eight inside, one on uh, outside of that vehicle. One cartridge apparently was not recovered. Uh, but again, all of that evidence clearly demonstrates all of that. So there's nothing about the forensic evidence that is inconsistent with Mr. Woodward's theory of self-defense. There's nothing among the testimony that is inconsistent that a reasonable person would believe that he had to act in self-defense. And the evidence at this point is overwhelming that he did in fact act in self-defense. And the state certainly has not disproved that by beyond a reasonable doubt. The only other issue that I would like to raise uh, is that there was no evidence introduced as to Roger Pecor at all in terms of the time of his death. We have a statement of particulars in this particular case. It's 24 hours either side of uh, September 3rd. So it's September 2nd through September 4th. We do not know whether Mr. We know that Roger Pecor was alive when he was removed from the scene. We have a dearth of evidence as to the time period. And we know he was dead at the time of his autopsy, which is outside of the statement in particular. But we don't know whether he was alive or dead within the statement in particular. So they failed to prove that uh, Mr. Pecor even died uh, within the statement in particular. Mm -hmm. Thank you. State's response I'll, I'll to the motion. Respond, I'll respond to the last one first. We have uh, abundant evidence that the acts that led to his death occurred on the third. That's what we're charged with showing. The autopsy, the doctor testified when he did the autopsy. I believe it was on the fourth. The fine, I looked at. But that, it, that's not the test. The test is the acts that led to the death. So um, I, would, I would suggest the court not spend time on that. The, um, I have a case called Cruz, uh, 189 Southern 2nd, 822. And I, I'd first note that where we're at right now is, is, you may approach, thank you. is essentially where we were at the Andrew Brown hearing. Uh, there's already been a finding that demonstrated to the to what I believe is the uh, legal standard uh, to go to a jury, which is there's evidence that supports 
been a finding of lack of imminent, uh, imminent threat. But the problem with Mr. Eisenmenger's argument is that he spends a lot of time fashioning the evidence in the way that he wants it to, to go, as opposed to saying, yes, there's, that we have eyewitness testimony that is inconsistent with justification. We have a surveillance video that is inconsistent with justification. We have the initial statement of the defendant where he's, he's indicating that he's doing this out of anger and taking the law into his own hands that is inconsistent with justification. We have the defendant's statements that the court just heard where his motivation is he was driven over the edge by the stress of this constantly being on his family. Nothing imminent at the time, but what had been going on over a period of time. That it drove him into a rage and he could not control himself. Not that he was in fear and needed to defend himself or his family. He waited for the lights to go out to do his attack. Um, when, when he got to the corner of the house, which I would point out, he would have to be over there for any of this to fit in his theory anyways, not waiting at his residence to decide if there is an imminent threat or not. Uh, he charged, and his purpose was for the element of surprise, ferocity, and accuracy. And it was to punish, the, his statement is, is, is indicating he is going to end the harassment of his family. Not that anything was imminent, not that anything was happening right then, and frankly the testimony from the witnesses who testified is contrary to that evidence. So if you look at Head Note 8, a defendant's in inconsistent statements can, however, constitute grounds on which the trier of fact may reject, reject the defendant's uh, reasonable hypothesis of innocence. Thus, a motion for uh, quit, judgment of acquittal should be denied where a jur jury could easily and reasonably infer guilt reject the defendant's explanation of self-defense either because the defendant gave false, inconsistent, or incriminating statements or because a common sense view of the circumstantial evidence would allow the jury to re reject the defendant's story as unbelievable. Those, all those things are present here, Judge. The physical evidence, uh, the hate, the actions of the defendant that he admits himself, frankly, I don't believe that he, while he said imminent in his uh, testimony at the, uh, the stand your ground hearing, I believe six times, maybe seven, uh, just saying words does not change the, the facts and circumstances that he's describing. And he has described nothing that in any way shows imminence. That's why we filed our motion in limine to preclude the instruction before we started the case. The, 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 the problem with the defendant's theory is it does not fit justifiable use of deadly force on the facts that he describes in the standard ground hearing. And, and those facts that he describes there are inconsistent with what he told law enforcement on the uh, morning hours of the crime. And so this, this should go to the jury for their decision. Mr. Espen said at least one thing that I absolutely agree with. Just saying words does not change the facts. Just because my client did not use the correct legal terminology to describe what he was going through at the time of his statement to uh, Officer Anderson and Detective Kane Watson at that time uh, does not change the fact that he clearly described actions and threats. He used the term harassment. He was ending the harassment. He was dealing with the harassment. Now, simply because he characterized it in the general sense of harassment does not change the fact that clearly he made it clear at that time and in his later testimony and what we saw actually happening, when you refer back to it, were credible threats. Simply because he, as a layperson, did not know how to use the language credible threat and use the term harassment 
does not change the fact that what was going on were credible threats against his family and himself. And he consistently referred them back to the surveillance. And the surveillance would show the nature of what he was dealing with and why he dealt with it and why he had to deal with it. And if you look at the surveillance, what was occurring was credible threats, not just harassment, which is a more benign term. What was shown by that video, that surveillance video, was ongoing forcible felony of aggravated stalking. That is uncontrovertible. And he acted to end that. So it's and the law says that he has an absolute right to use even deadly force to deal with that. Okay, thank you. Having considered the arguments of the parties and the case law that was presented, at this time I'm going to deny the motion for judgment of acquittal and viewed in the light most favorable to the state, I believe that the state has presented competent but rebuttable evidence to establish each of the elements of the charges contained in the charging document to the required level of a prima facie showing and that the issue of self-defense ultimately is for the trier of fact. So I have denied the motion. How would the defense like to proceed? Uh, I'm going to proceed with some evidence. I've been asked to break for lunch and uh, I have some witnesses lined up for after lunch. All right, and if I may ask, and I'm certainly not going to hold the defense to this timetable per se, but do you have an estimate of how much time the defense's case in chief? I hope to end sometime Friday. Okay. All right. So uh, what time do you all want to come back then? 1.30 as we instructed the jury to come back at 1.20? I know we you have, have the 1.15 hearing. Right. And one of us will, will slide down here once we see where what's going on. But yes, uh, 1.30 is what we'll request. Okay. Okay. We will be in recess then until 1.30. Thank you all. Do you want to...